Hey everybody, welcome back to Young Engineers of Today. Hope you had a good couple of days, and I hope you're ready to continue with Arduino. Because that's what we're going to do. Um, because that's what we've been doing, and we're going to continue to do it. Should be pretty cool, though. Uh, we're actually going to go over digital input today. We did analog input on Tuesday. So as you guys know, uh, the difference of that, think back to the, the two different types of light switches. you got the regular flippy light switch, that's digital. And then you got the, the the wheel that you can turn in order to dim the lights, and that's analog. So we did the the, the dimmer one, um, where we hooked up an an LDR or a photoresistor, photocell photoresistor, um, to a uh, to a circuit, and basically simulated dimming the lights and seeing how that changed resistance. Um, we set it up so that an LED would get brighter or darker based on ambient light. And um, we also, very importantly, we took a look at serial prints in order to be able to see what was going on inside of the Arduino's head. Now, think back to uh, how it was utilized, and remember that serial print is and serial print line is only as useful as we make it. That is to say, there is nothing that serial print sends out by default. We can't just set up a serial print and have it print out all the use, useful information for us just on its own. Uh, we can, however, um, <clears throat> make serial print useful by telling it what to print, having it print useful stuff for us. So we can say serial print and then the LDR variable, and then it will start to print out the LDR variable. Uh, or serial prints uh, LED, and it will start to print out the the, the uh, value uh, that we're sending to the LED. But it's not going to send that stuff on its own. We need to tell it what to send. Anyway, um, getting a little bit ahead of myself. Well, or a little bit sidetracked. Let's get started with digital input. Digital input is thankfully simpler on a coding side and on a um, kind of on a hardware side too sort of kind of it's not going to be in this particular circuit just because buttons are strange but by and large um, buttons are simpler apparatuses than things like LDRs and stuff like that because when you're working on a big complex circuit you kind of want to make sure that at all you know like at minimum resistance the LDR is not um, you know so conductive that your circuits getting overloaded and then at maximum resistance you want to make sure that you know the the other resistors you set up to stop the LDR from you know to, to supplement the LDR so that the circuit doesn't get overloaded when it's not resisting, aren't too much resistance, so nothing works when the LDR is fully resisting, things like that. You know, you have to worry about the more mathematical, mathematical electrical kind of side of things when you're working with analog. Whereas with digital, it's just either on or off. So you can set up a circuit to be working when it's on, and then you don't really care about whether or not it's working when it's off as long as it's turning off when it's supposed to. So in that sense, it can be simpler. Um, it's not going to look like it right now, just because, again, there are so many pins on this button. But that's okay. That's okay. And in fact, part of it looks more complex because this button is hooked up to the same circuit as uh, our analog circuit. But what we're going to do is um, we're going to go ahead and get circuits.io open, and we're going to start up, to no one's surprise, a new project. And then... Uh, excuse me for just a moment. All right, I am back. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start up a new project. Again, to nobody's surprise, because all of these are going to be their own electronics labs. And again, we should all be used to this by now, the time it takes to think about everything. And 
And then we're looking at the breadboard again. Very familiar, very comfortable sight. <laughs> All of this is nothing new. So I'm going to go ahead and rotate it again and bring in our standard components. So we're going to want our Arduino, or Arduion, apparently, our Arduino. Ugh. Spelling. Spelling is hard. All right. We've got our Arduino Uno brought out. And let's see here. We're going to need, it looks like, a 10,000 ohm resistor. Yeah, 10,000 ohm resistor. Or is that 1,000? I'm pretty sure it's 10,000. Regardless, let's go ahead and bring out a resistor. Bam. We're going to bring out an LED. Bam. Another resistor. Bam. Because we've got one resistor here and one resistor here. And of course, here's our LED. Now we just need the button. So I'll just do a search for button. We got two different kinds of push buttons. Uh, they're just different sizes. That's really the only difference between them. Um, I am going to utilize the smaller push button. Because this one should still, yeah, it will. Still make it across the, uh, the middle gap, which is what I'm interested in. So here we are with all of our components. We've got an Arduino, we've got two resistors, we've got one LED, and we've got one push button. And as you can see, the only thing I've rotated is the Arduino. Otherwise, everything is exactly as is when it comes off the component tray. And that's good because we're actually gonna, we're gonna mess with this stuff a little bit. So I just wanted to have a baseline. So first off, we should change the values of our resistors because neither of them are going to be 1,000 ohm resistors. One of them is going to be a 10,000 ohm resistor. So you're gonna have brown, black, orange. And one of them is going to be a 330, whoa, 330 ohm resistor. So let's go ahead, change that to 330 ohms. So you're gonna have a brown, black, orange, and an orange, orange, brown. Those are gonna be our two resistors. Next, we're just going to rotate our LED 90 degrees like we always do, so it'll straddle to uh, rails. And we're actually going to rotate our push button 90 degrees as well. And that's because uh, the, the push button will, when it's pressed, it will complete a connection from one side to the other, or from one side to the other. However, a push button will always have a connection between the two rails on either side. That was a pretty dark color that's kind of hard to see. Make it yellow. That does not make it any easier to see. We'll make it a light blue. Well, whatever. I've just messed it up. Either way. A push button will always have these light blue connections. That is to say, um, from one pin to another pin on the same side. Uh, and then pressing the button will allow the purple connections to become valid, that is from one pin to another pin on the other side. And it, it works both ways. So, you know, you can have, oops, um, you can have connections going up, across, and then back the other way as well. Basically a push button, you can think of like a gate in essence. And it's not allowing things from one side to the other side of the gate. Allowing thing, it, you have to make a U-turn once you hit the gate. Unless, of course, the button is pressed and then the gate is up and you can go through the gate. So, okay. Let's go ahead and get our circuit hooked up. <sighs> Let's see here. Let me bring this stuff over. So I have more room over on this side. And then let's take a look at our circuit. So I'm going to have the push button straddle this middle area just like that nothing crazy because this is the easiest way i mean this there's a lot of empty space in here anyway in the middle and putting it up here that would be totally valid except the only problem is we can't really like as you can see the push button is large enough that we can really only connect to one side so we straddle across the middle 
in order to ensure that we can utilize both sides of the push button. So we got that. And then we're going to use our 10,000 ohm resistor and we're going to, whoops, we're going to connect it from one of the terminals on the push button to the ground rail. Is it, yeah, it's the ground rail. To the ground rail on this half of the, um, this half of the circuit. So far, so good, right? Makes, makes sense. Then we're going to be running a jumper wire from a, the, the other terminal on the same side to the power rail. I'm going to go ahead and make that red just so we know that it's a power connection. So we've got, we've got power coming through around to the same side or through the resistor onto the ground rail. So this half, once we get the power and ground hooked up on the Arduino, will be a complete circuit. Pretty straightforward, right? In fact, let me go ahead and should we send out 5 volts? Yeah, we'll send out 5 volts. Let's go ahead and hook up our power and ground right now. The reason I'm doing this is just so we're not crossing wires, although it does kind of complicate things a little bit more. So now we've got our power and ground wires on our Arduino hooked up to the circuit as well. There is power. Once this Arduino is turned on, there will be power running through this rail, through this jumper wire, through this rail, through the button, back out through the other side, through the resistor, and down into the ground, which will then go into the ground on the Arduino. Then we're going to hook up our LED. Let me see here. We'll hook it up. We'll actually rotate it 180 degrees, so it's facing this way. So we got our anode, we got our cathode. Our cathode is going to be hooked up to the ground using our 330 ohm resistor, just like before. And our anode is going to be hooked up to, yeah, our anode is going to be hooked up to, let's make it pin 2 on the Arduino. Just like all of the circuits we've hooked up a million times before, you've got the LED getting power from one of the pins on the Arduino out through the resistor into the ground rail. No surprises there. Then we've got one more connection we need to make, and that's actually going to be from this side of the button. So you can use either the top or the bottom terminal. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to go ahead and use the top terminal on the opposite side of the button from our completed circuit, and I'm going to hook it up to pin 3. And for the sake of distinguishing it from the LED, I want to make it a purple one. So you remember what I was saying about how the, the, the button is like, a, is like a gate? Once the gate is open, then power can travel to the other side. So once this button is pressed, power will travel from here through the button and then through the jumper wire into pin 3, but only while the button is pressed. And that's part of the reason why we put this 10,000 ohm resistor here, is A, to you know reduce the amount of power going through, and B, to make this jumper wire right here the path of least resistance once this button is pressed. Because it will then have a choice between going down a jumper wire into the Arduino or going through a 10,000 ohm resistor. And we want to make sure that the power, in order to get as clear a signal as possible, is going to travel through the jumper wire whenever the button is pressed. Otherwise, whenever the button's not pressed, it just does the same thing. It does that U-turn like it always does and back out through the resistor and then into the ground and everything like that. So that makes sense to everybody? Raise your hand if you've got that circuit built. Okay. Mostly everybody. We're waiting on a couple more hands.
So I'll give you guys about mm, two two more minutes to work on it, and then we'll we'll move over to the coding side of things. Let's see here. And if you have any questions about the circuit too, obviously feel free to let me know. I know it is a little odd looking. All right, well, let's get started on the coding side of things, just so we can we can get familiar with that as well. Very easy stuff. Don't sweat it. Um, we'll uh, we'll go through it step by step as well, and we'll we'll actually see some ways to to streamline the code too. So let me go ahead and get the Arduino program open. The IDE. And that'll take a minute too, as it always does. Yeah, it is based on processing. They were totally right. Okay. All right. So as always, got to have our baseline functions. Always, 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 always. And then we got to set up our pins. So let's go ahead and say pin mode. What do we got here? Uh, pin 2 is going to be output, and pin mode, pin 3 is going to be input. Just like that. Nothing, nothing crazy, nothing, nothing terribly new, nothing you haven't seen before. Um, now, let's take a look at how everything's going to be done in void loop. So, if you remember back to our analog input, we basically stored the result of our um, of our input into a variable. Now we could do something like that in this. In fact, we yeah. Why don't we do that first, in fact? We'll do it just the way we did it before, except with digital input. So we'll say int button equals digital read 3. So this, this should look very familiar. Uh, instead of analog read, we're going to have digital read, but it is reading from pin 3, and it is placing the result into button. Now, with a digital read, you're either going to get a 1 or a 0. A 0 if it's off, and receive, like you're receiving no signal, and a 1 if you are receiving a signal. Which is very different from the analog read, which gives you uh, any number of values, anywhere from 0 to, I don't know, 5, let's see here. 5, 12. Maybe it's up to 1,028, maybe it's up to, to 
2024, maybe it's up to, to 2048, you know, who knows. Um, <clears throat> either way, you, you get a you whole range of values under analog read. This one though, very simple, very straightforward. It's just either a one or a zero. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn the, the LED on, but only when the button is pressed. And we're going to utilize a very specific means to do that. Now we could, in fact, we could, in fact, just do something as simple as we could do that. And that would be very simple. However, I'm going to do something a little bit different here. We're going to leverage control flow, which is just basically a fancy term for if statements. Now, show of hands, how many of you are familiar with if statements? Imagine we're probably going to have a few hands. OK, so if statements are The most basic form of a way to have your program, uh, in essence, change its flow based on its state. And what I mean by that is um, it would not really do you much good if no matter what happened, no matter what you did when you were using your program, it did the same thing every single time it ran. Every single time it ran. Imagine if... You had a program dictating your life, which it, it I guess, suppose could be sort of thought of like that. If you had a program dictating your life and um, you had one that sort of controlled how you got ready each morning before you walked out the door. You always had the same breakfast. You always put on the same clothes. You always put on the same shoes. You always left at the same exact time with the same backpack and everything. You know, and that, that could be all well and good for, I don't know, anywhere from half to 90% of your cases even, depending upon the program. You know, that, that could be just all well and good. But let's say, you know, that the same outfit you wear every day is just like a t-shirt and jeans and shoes. Just very, very simple. Covers most of the situations, right? What if it's snowing that day? What if it's raining that day? What if it's cold? What if it's really hot? It doesn't do you any good in those situations to be walking out, walking outside with the same exact outfit. You change your outfit not only in necessarily how you're feeling that day, but also in what the weather's like. You adapt to it. If it's really cold, you wear a jacket. If it's really hot, maybe instead of jeans, you wear shorts. If you're going to the pool, you're going to be wearing a swimsuit. If it's raining outside, you might grab an umbrella. So you do these little internal checks. You go like, okay, is it raining outside? If yes, I should grab an umbrella. If no, well then just ignore that. Don't grab an umbrella. Continue as normal. Is it really cold outside? If yes, get a heavy jacket. Maybe get some boots. If it's snowing, you know, whatever. That is the function of if statements in a program. Let's say we're writing a program for I don't know, uh, like a little simple dungeon crawler. We want the monsters to attack the hero and the hero to lose health. So we can have an if statement for the monsters. If next to hero, attack hero. And an if statement for the hero. If attacked by monsters, lose health. And then, you know, if health is zero, game over. That kind of thing. If pick up health potion, increase health. Things like that they allow the program to, in essence, run uniquely or update itself, in a sense, based on its own status. And the structure of it is like this. You have an if, you have something in parentheses, you have an opening and a closing curly bracket. This something in a parentheses is some sort of statement. In this case, we'll say if button equals with two equal signs one the two equal signs 
is something that is necessary. Uh, the, that, that basically tells the computer that we're asking if something is equal to one as opposed to telling the computer that something is equal to one. If we had that, whenever we ran this, it would automatically set button equal to one regardless of whether or not we're actually pressing the button and so the LED would always be on. But if we do this, we're asking the computer if button is equal to one, which will only be true in case we're holding down the button. So we say if button is equal to one, then run the code in here, which is to turn on the LED. Then it will, so if this is true, you know, we're running through the code, we hit this line, the button's being held down, so button is one. We hit here, it asks us if button is equal to one, it is. So we go, okay, we'll go through this. We turn it on, then we turn it off. So the button will turn on very quickly as it stands right now. So we'll need something else. Thankfully, we have just that. So you can have sequences of if statements, one after the other. We can have if button equals one, else if button equals two, else if button equals three, else if button equals four, else if whatever, whatever. We can have any number of checks for something. But let's say, again, to go back to this uh, analogy with the the t-shirt the and jeans thing, let's say that's your go-to outfit in case it's not raining or it's not, you know, um, super hot or super cold. There are a million different situations in which you might still wear a t-shirt and jeans. Maybe it's an overcast day. Maybe it's a fall day. Maybe it was raining earlier, but now it's no longer raining. Maybe... I don't know, it's nighttime. Maybe it's uh, sunny but cool. Maybe it's whatever. Maybe it's windy. There are all these situations in which we wouldn't necessarily want like a heavy jacket or snow boots or a swimsuit or an umbrella, but we can't possibly account for all of those situations individually. You know, what if the sky's green? I mean, you've got bigger things to worry about than what you're wearing outside that day, but <laughs> assuming you even want to go outside. But, you know, that could be a possible, you know, edge case in which you never really accounted for it in your own internal programming. Well, there is sort of a, a bucket catch-all kind of um, case in case something like that happens, and it's the else statement. And basically the else statement can be placed at a long, at any number, at the end of any number of if statements. Any number of if statements. If none of the if statements before it pan out to be true, the else will run. The else will always run if none of the if statements before it were true. If any of the if statements before it were true and the code inside it was executed, the else will not run. It's sort of like a, you can think of it like a default state that exists, um, you know, in, in, in case you're running into one of the many situations in which you want the program to operate normally. Again, though, it will not run if any of the if statements are executed. So in this case, we're asking if the button equals one. If the button is equal to one, we turn on the LED. Else, in this case, if button is not equal to one, turn the LED off. So if the button is equal to one, this if statement executes, this else statement does not. If the button is not equal to one, this if statement does not execute, and this else statement does. So what we should be seeing then is we should be seeing the LED turning on as long as the button is held down, and then turning off as soon as we release the button. So let me go ahead and copy and paste this into um, the code on Autodesk Circuits. Bam. Upload and run. So now we're simulating everything. It's successfully compiled. And I can just click on the button. If I click on it really quickly, nothing really happens. But if I hold down the button, I can see that the LED turns on. If I let go of the button, the LED turns off. I can pulse it by clicking the button <clears throat> Not like rapidly, 
But if I do it rapidly enough, I can kind of I can kind of simulate a pulse width modulation signal because this is slow enough. Um, but basically, it's just on anytime the button is held down and off anytime it's not. So that's pretty simple, right? In fact, we can make this even simpler. Let me go back to the code. So we've got if button is equal to one. Well, I'm about to teach you something. As far as computer programming is concerned, there are some constants. Zero, the number zero, is always assumed to be false by a computer. Always. So we could say that. This is kind of a confusing statement. It would never actually run. But we're asking if false. And in essence, what we're saying there is if false is ever true, then turn on the LED. We know that false is never true because that doesn't really make any sense. So it would never execute. But we could do something like that. We could, we could shorten things. Now, on most languages with most compilers, one, nowadays at least, one is equal to true. On some languages, on some compilers, and certainly more prevalent in older uh, compilers and things like that, any number that is not zero could be equal to true. So negative 355 could be considered true because it is specifically not zero. But we're not going to worry about that because we know that this button value will only hold either a one or a zero and we also know that zero is always going to be false. And one is always going to be true because it is not zero. So what we can do here is we can just type the word button. So then here in parentheses, it'll get replaced with either a one or a zero, just like you would, you would sort of do that mental replacement in your head with whatever values inside of it, a computer will do that with a variable. So then we come, it comes down to this. It replaces it with whatever values inside. If it's zero, we're asking if true is false, and that's never true, so this would never run. However, if it's filled with a one, we're asking if true is true, and yeah, it is, so it would run. So if we do that, we actually simplify our code a little bit, by eliminating this extraneous check, which is just kind of not necessary in this situation. It could be, you know, if we were actually looking for a specific value like four or something like that, then we want to have a check. But since we're looking for either one or zero, which are intrinsically recognized by the computer as true and false, we can just say if button, and it will figure, it will figure everything out on its own. And we can actually verify that we just type it in here. Oops, right, it's still running. Boop. Upload and run. And there you go, the LED is turning on. In fact, we could simplify this even more. We've been storing it in the variable. We don't even have to do that. Bam, because this is going to return either a one or a zero, right? And it's it's storing it into button, but button's been kind of a middleman. So we could actually say if digital read three, and then this will be replaced with either a one or a zero depending upon the state of the button. If it's true, turn it on. If it's not, don't turn it on. So let's go ahead and do that. Bam. 
digital read three and we'll upload and run it. And we can verify the LED turns on whenever the button's held down. Not groundbreaking stuff necessarily, but what we've done is we've actually simplified our code a little bit. And this is this is stuff that can that can save you time and memory if you ever get like further into programming. You know, if you ever find that this is a thing that's interesting to you, you can compress your programs and uh, save yourself some effort and save the computer some effort by doing stuff like that. Now, whether or not it's best practice. That's always up to the individual. There's a point where you can compress things so much, you can just keep compressing and compressing and compressing, compressing and compressing and compressing and, you know, piping things into other things. And eventually your code just kind of becomes an unreadable mess because there's there are so many, you know, small symbols and, and things like that packed into such a tight space and it's not formatted nicely that it can be hard for other people to read. This, though, this is pretty easy to read right here. So generally this can be considered a pretty good thing to do in order to clean up your code and sort of save effort on everybody's part. But, you know, as with everything else, everything in moderation. So keep in mind that you can always compress code to save effort and time, but don't do it to the detriment of your being able to read it in the future or anybody else being able to read it in the future. There's this, there's this axiom that's kind of <laughs> it's kind of appropriate. It's uh, it's just a, it's a joke more than anything else. But it's always write your code as if always write and comment your code as if some psychopath will be reading it in the future. Who knows where you live? The implication being, of course, that he would get really angry if your code is poorly written and come and find you. But you know, basically, try and make your own life and everyone else's life as easy as possible when you're writing code. Anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. Um, I want to, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I guess we can do that. We can go over some additional stuff too. So like, one of the things you can do with if statements is you can also nest them. So let's say we wanted to make sure that the button was pressed and the LDR was returning a specific value. So we could also say if analog read uh, four is greater than um, you know, 65 or something like that. Obviously, you guys know that we don't have an LDR hooked up to the circuit. I know that, but we're speaking in purely hypothetical terms here. So we could nest if statements like this as well. That is, however, generally considered not the best because you can nest them maybe two levels or something like that, but then they start to really get difficult to read and difficult to follow. And you're really better off um, either setting up specific situations, using cases, um, using other forms of, of control flow, or combining your if statements into larger if statements, like so. You can have additional, um, additional modifiers tacked on the if statements. So in that case, we wanted to make sure that both of those things were true before the LED turned on, right? We wanted to make sure, oh, come on. All right, fine, don't cooperate with me. It only goes back two or three commands. Um, in that case, we wanted to make sure that the, the, the button was being pressed and the LDR was returning a specific value. We did that with two if statements, one nested inside of the other. However, we can also, do something like that. You'll notice how I threw in two ampersands. That's a shorthand for if. So basically what we're saying here is if this statement is true and this statement is true, then this whole thing is true. Then this executes. If either one of these is false, it doesn't execute. This, this doesn't run. The, I guess the brother to that is the two vertical lines, uh, which if you hold down shift and hit the backslash key on your keyboard, you'll get those vertical pipes. 
um, that's or. So what we're saying here is if this is true or this is true, then that run this. And this is a much more forgiving one because you only need one of them to be true. Both of them have to be false in order for this code to not run. Pretty straightforward, right? You can even you can even chain these together into epically long combinations of uh, you know uh, different conditionals and everything like that in order to create these very specific situations in which the code will execute, um, which can be kind of annoying sometimes. Um, but sometimes they're a better solution than nesting if statements. So again, approach it with you know a, a rational mind. Take a look at it and be like, is this easy to read? If it is, yeah, then keep it like that. If not, then no, probably don't do that. Uh, finally, you've got the exclamation point, which is the not. So now what we're asking here is if digital read three is true, fine, or analog read four is greater than fifty. So if either of these are true, and if digital read 5 is not true. So this has to be false in addition to one of these two being true in order for this code to execute. So these statements can get kind of, kind of wacky too, and get kind of all over the place. But you can really set it up. There's a lot of power in it. You can do a lot with... Um, with this statement, just speaking purely from a possibility standpoint, there's uh, you can check for just about any specific situation as long as you know how to phrase it properly. But all that aside, that pretty much does it for inputs. Um, it gave us a little glimpse into uh, control flow, as well as buttons and LDRs. I know, super exciting buttons. Um, so let's actually take a look at what's going to be next. I believe next we're going to be talking about um, potentiometers, possibly? Let me go ahead and look it up. I need to open it up anyway. Yeah, lesson five is potentiometers. Which you might be like, I don't know what that is. Well, potentiometers are essentially a, um, a resistor that you can change the resistance on just by turning a knob on them. And that might not sound that exciting, but there's a lot you can do with potentiometers. There's a lot you do. There's a, there, you interact with a lot of potentiometers, a lot more than you might think. You ever change the volume on a stereo with one of those big knobs, whether that's in a car or on a, you know, a boom box or something like that. Oh my God, boom box. What am I from the nineties? Um, that's a potentiometer. That right there is a potentiometer, especially if it's a very, you know, big expensive stereo. That is a potentiometer. Dimmer switches on lights. Uh, I believe it does, actually. Let me see here. Let me check that. Sorry, the question was, does the uh, Arduino programming language also include the else if command as a third else statement, such as other programming languages? And that's one of those things, um, it depends on, they can depend on the programming language as well, because some require an else if. See, else if in and of itself, like the, the singular word, uh, is not doesn't exist, which makes me think that um, in the Arduino programming language, you use a series of if statements, like so. Um, so you'd want to make sure that, although I guess since you can you can put an if after an else, I suppose it would be possible. No, the, okay, so for those of you following along at home, or maybe not, um, the distinction between these two is Normally, with strings of if statements like so, if one of them is true, the only one that is guaranteed to not execute is the else at the end. If any more of these if statements are true, it's possible that, well, they will execute as well. So, like, if 
digital read three, if analog read four, if digital read five, if digital read six, if digital read seven, if you're getting signals in on those um, as well, then any number of these if statements will also execute in addition to the first one, which can be undesirable um, uh, behavior. Sometimes you only want one of them to run. You don't want all of them to run or many of them to run or something like that. So that's why some program, programming languages have an else if, which is an exclusive. So if, uh, if one of those, if you use a single if statement as well as a list of else, state, else if statements and an else statement, if one of those if statements executes, the other ones are guaranteed to not execute at that point. Um, so that's what the dif distinction can be between the two. And I believe maybe that the Arduino programming language supports else if, um, considering it didn't throw back a syntax error when I tried to string the two together. So yeah, I believe else if exists. And then also if you have more than one if statement, do you also need the same amount of else statements? No, no. Um, you only, you only have, you only need one else statement. Um, I believe you only can have one else. Yeah, you can only have one else statement anyway uh, for each level of if statements. Uh, and what I mean by that is you could have another like layer of if and else inside of an if statement. But there can only be one else on this layer for each for you know because there it, there can only be one else statement on this layer. There can only be one else statement on this layer uh, because there is no specificity to an else statement. It simply happens if nothing else happens. You can have any number of if statements because you can have any number of situations that you want to have a specific thing happen for a specific scenario. But else, the only time else runs is when nothing else runs. None of these are other if statements runs. And that can get confusing because what if you have two else statements? Which one will run if none of the if statements run? I guess by default, both of them, but that's not something that you can explicitly control because you cannot necessarily control when an else statement is going to run, other than including all of the if statements that are exclusive, that, that, you, that you know you don't want the else statement to execute on. So in that situation, you can only have one else statement. You can have else if statements, but you can only have one else statement. Also, I'm starting to get that semantic satiation, and else is really starting to look like a weird word to me. Just, you know, when you, when you look at something for long enough, and you look at it enough, you, you mention it enough, and you think about it enough, it starts to seem weird. Else is one of those strange words right now. Um, that, that happens a lot when you're programming because you'll start typing a word a lot and you'll kind of look at it and you'll go like, this word doesn't really make much sense to me anymore. It's a very strange phenomenon. Anyway, <laughs> potentiometers are adjustable uh, resistors. And potentiometers are actually very important components um, because they allow you to affect uh, the, the flow of a... Um, <coughs> excuse me, the flow of a circuit, electronically speaking, while it's on, without having to swap out other components, without having to swap out resistors and things like that. All the resistors we've worked with so far have been fixed resistors. If you wanted to change the resistance on a circuit, well, except for the LDR, if you wanted to change the resistance on the circuit, you would have to swap out the resistor. The potentiometer changes the game in the sense that you don't have to do that anymore. You can change the resistance on a circuit while it's running. It also means you have to be more careful with it, obviously, but are more mindful of it, of it, but it is possible. Um, without getting started on that, though, because I want to, I want to devote an entire class to that. I think I'm going to call it here. So we're going to do the uh, the question and answer time, and then I'll go ahead and, uh, or I'll do the poll questions, and then we'll leave it open to question and answer time. And if you don't have any questions about anything after we ask the poll questions, you're more than welcome to head out. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you on Tuesday.